this is pretty cool. Um, remember, it's, it's taking into account this cosine theta. So it's something kind of complicated and pretty useful. Um, the calculation of it is actually really simple. If, you, if we represent f as like f1, f2, f3, and then let's say we represent d as d1, d2, d3, then the calculation of this, you, you just multiply the x components together plus multiplying the y components together plus multiplying the z components together. So um, this would be, we could represent it as f1, d1 plus f2, d2 plus f3, d3. And one thing that's nice about this is that uh, if I just hand you two vectors, a force vector and a displacement vector, and I ask you to calculate work, for example, you don't have to know what this angle is at all. As long as you know what the two vectors are, you just do a simple multiplication and adding them together. That tells you the work. Um, I'm not going to take the time right now to explain or you know, to develop why that works, but it is it is cool to see why that works. So if anybody wants to see that at any point, I can probably show you at the end of a class time so other people don't have to sit through it. Um, torque is a little more complicated. It is, and specifically I'm talking about this cross product. Um, for one thing, it's giving us a vector instead of just a number. So the dot product is just giving us a number. The torque is giving us a vector, which is a number, a length, together with a direction. So that in itself makes it more complicated. The direction of the vector is also pretty important. Um, this has to give us a vector that points into the board if we set it up like this for torque. As I mentioned before, we'll use cross product to represent other things as well. So I'm going to give you a geometric description of what this cross product is in general. And then I'll show you how to calculate it. I should have left my plane up here. Um, OK, let's say that we've got two vectors. Um, I'll call them A and B. And they're just two random vectors. And what I've done is I've taken those two random vectors and I've put them to where their, their tail end are at the same point. And when you do that, they determine some plane. Unless they point in exactly the same direction or in exactly opposite directions, then they will determine a flat plane. So there's only one plane that contains these two vectors that I picked. If I want to calculate the cross product of that, what you use to calculate torque, then the way people have chosen it is that it needs to be perpendicular to this plane. And that makes sense if you think about torque. Um, this R and the, the force vector are in the plane of the board or the wall. And then the torque is supposed to go perpendicular to the wall, straight into the wall. So this is the plane. The torque is perpendicular. Same thing happens with the general cross product. Um, so this is, let's write this as A cross B. So first thing, A cross B is perpendicular to the plane. With vectors, people usually use the word normal to the plane. So I'm going to use that word. Um, people also use the word orthogonal. So we could also say orthogonal here, or per perpendicular. And you just need to be familiar with all three of those terms, meaning the same thing. All right, then second. 
the magnitude of that thing needs to give us the magnitude of the torque if we're in the setting of torque. So we've already talked about what that is actually doing. It's, it's giving us this green length times this blue length. So if I take the magnitude of this A cross B, uh, it needs to be, I'm going to write it like this, A times B times sine of theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. So one thing that I glossed over when we were over here is that um, this theta that I'm talking about is the angle between R and F. So if I extend R this way, then theta is this angle. And so this theta is um, complementary to this angle. And since this forms a right triangle down here, this theta is also right here. So sine of this theta, which is the angle between R and F, um, gives you a ratio of this force vector to this blue side. I just wanted to mention that because I didn't want you to get confused with sine being used to, to compute this and cosine being used to compute this when they look really similar in the picture. It's because of the way we're choosing this angle. Um, I meant to put another bar right here, so if you're blindly following my notes and you don't know what the heck I wrote, that's, that's supposed to say the length of A cross B. Okay. Just saying that A cross B is normal to the plane doesn't actually quite give us enough information. Because there's another, well, let's, let's come over here to the torque. There's another vector that's orthogonal to this plane or normal to the, the wall that comes out toward us instead of going in. And then the same thing here. If you take the negative of that vector, it points in the opposite direction. So we need a specific way of saying, are we talking about this? direction or are we talking about the opposite direction? Um, do you think like psi A, B, psi theta? Yes, as opposed to what? I was just, I was just curious why, why uh, A times B is equal to A, B, psi theta. Okay, it's, if you come back to how we did torque here, so this is, you don't have to think of this as a generalization of torque, but if you've, if you've studied torque before, it can be helpful, I think, to think about this, or even just to get an intuitive grasp. This can be helpful. Um, the magnitude of the torque, so the magnitude of this vector going into the board, we want that to be, it needs to, to multiply the distance um, of this arm. So if I have a really long wrench arm, then I don't have to put as much force. And we need the component of the force that's going perpendicular to the wrench arm. If you multiply those two together, that's what is defined as the magnitude of the torque. Um, and I, I don't know the history of how that was developed, but I'm guessing it just came from experiments and um, developing that. What it represents geometrically, though, is, is actually pretty nice. And this is something else that I wanted to write down that will help to answer your question. Um, geometrically, what we have here is a parallelogram. If I draw, if I bring this force vector over to here, and then I draw this F right there, I've got a parallelogram. And if I take this length of R times this length of the blue one, that's giving me base times height. That's the area of that parallelogram. So this is the area of the parallelogram created by A and B. So if I form the parallelogram up here on the plane, 
using A and B, something like this. And I look at this area, that's what this is. I'm glad you asked that question. Does anybody want to take a shot at how we determine which one of these we're choosing? If you've seen it in another context. All right, it's something called the right hand rule. So the way it works is if I'm doing A cross B, then Different people do this differently. Usually in physics, they use some kind of curling thing that I don't, I've never learned. But all you have to do for this class is um, take your hand and point it in the direction of the first vector, and then wrap the fingers from your right hand toward the other vector. So I'll need to flip my hand over and wrap my fingers from A to B like this. If I do this, and I wrap from A to B, then I'm doing the, um, the much larger angle. The angle that we're talking about is the smaller angle between them. Um, the way they get the parallelogram. So if I'm doing A cross B, my thumb on my right hand is pointing down. That tells me that this is actually A cross B, and this is negative A cross B. So that turns out to be negative A cross B, and this down here turns out to be the actual A cross B, the way I've drawn it. And then, you know, if we switched, if we did B cross A, then we would get this one. Because if I take my right hand and I wrap from B to A, my thumb points up, um, it points in that direction, and the area of the parallelogram is the magnitude of that vector. It's still the same parallelogram, so it's still the same area. So we know that these two vectors are exactly equal. So I'm just going to say right angle here. Okay. Now the way that you calculate this thing looks a little beastly the first time you see it. And instead of just giving it to you as a straight up formula to memorize, which would be um, a little painful, I'm going to give it to you in a slightly less painful way that uses matrices. And if you've never worked with matrices, that is no problem at all. Um, to calculate this thing, You can memorize the formula that, that will pop out of this, so if you don't want to do it this way, that's okay. Um, but here's the way that you can do it. Um, I'm going to take the components of A and put them in the second column. So this is going to be a 3 by 3 matrix. I'm going to take A and put it in the second column, so that would be A1, A2, A3. I'm going to take B and put it in the third column. And then in the first column, I'm going to stick unit vectors, so vectors of length 1, that point in the directions of the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So earlier, I drew this xy, z coordinate system. And what I'm going to define now is the unit vectors that point in these directions. And uh, we're going to call them i, j, and k in this class. So I'm just going to represent them like this. I've been using this little half arrow above the letter to say this is a vector, not just um, a number, not a scalar. If you can't read my handwriting, this says i, j, k. So for example, if I want to write i and it's bracket form, 
he goes one unit in the x direction and zero units in the y direction and zero units in the z direction. So that's one unit. Um, in physics classes, you'll usually see this written a little bit differently. They may use something like, like uh, x hat instead of i, something like that. So you do need to be able to go back and forth between notations like this. But the reason this is useful is that, remember how earlier I told you that you can, you can take a force vector and break it up into pieces going in two different directions, two different orthogonal directions? If you've got one in three dimensions, you can do the same thing to break it up into pieces going in three different directions. So you can rewrite it using these three vectors. So if I've got a vector x, y, z, I can rewrite it as the sum of three different vectors, one going in the i direction, one in the j direction, one in the k direction. Um, so I'm going to leave some space and write i plus something times j plus something times k. We know that these three vectors just have length one. So to get the vectors that I actually want, what do I need to do? Yeah, I need to, I need to multiply them by specific numbers. What are the numbers I need to multiply them by? Yeah, they're a, b, b, one, e, two, a, two. Yeah, good. The, the x, y, and z components of the vector. So a1, a2, a3 for a. If I've got this vector, it's just going to be x, y, and z. So I'm thinking of these as just three numbers. And by the way, I mentioned the word scalar a second ago. When I have a number by itself, I'm going to call that a scalar sometimes in this class. And the reason I do that is in the context of vectors, it's nice to be able to say whether a, a variable is representing a vector or just a number. And um, to describe just a number, I'm going to say scalar. And the reason I call it a scalar is because it scales the vector that it's multiplying. That, that it's, uh, yeah, that's being multiplied with. So what I mean is, if I take this vector i and I multiply it by a number, that just scales it out by a factor of whatever that number was. And that's why we call these numbers scaling. All that was to say that up here, I'm going to put i, j, and k. something called taking the determinant of a matrix and I don't expect anyone to have ever done that. If you have, that's great, it will help you, but I don't expect you to have done that. The way that you do it is you, you focus on this top row first of all. I'm going to have three terms in this determinant. One of them is going to be i times something, one of them is going to be j times something, and one of them is going to be k times something. Um, The way I'm going to represent it first is I'm going to think of, I'm going to take the i and I'm going to cross out the, the, the column of i and write down what's left over here in front of i. So actually I'm thinking of crossing out the column and the row. All that's left over is a2, a3, b2, b3. you what this represents in a second. Um, now I'm going to do the same thing for J and K, and then we're going to add those together. Except there's, there's a little twist in it. 
to get this vector to point the right way that we want it to point, when I do the J piece, I have to make it negative. Instead of adding it, I have to subtract it. So I'm going to do minus and then do the same thing but with J. And then I'm going to do plus and do the same thing about with K. So what do I mean by do the same thing go with J? What's going to be left over? A1, A1 A1, or A1, or A1, A3. A1, A3. A1, A3. OK, good. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Take the J, delete the, the column in the row, and you know what's left over. So for K, it looks like this. Nope, it does not look like that. Now, any ideas about what these, these three things represent? Yeah, it's going to be the determinant again. So if you've studied matrices before in linear algebra, this would be really nice. If you do study linear algebra at some point, you'll already have an idea of how to calculate a determinant, which will be nice. Um, these are going to be numbers. They tell, us, they tell us how to scale i, j, and k to get this vector. And the way that you calculate these, these numbers is you multiply the diagonals together. So I'm going to multiply a2 with b3 and b2 with a3. And you subtract, so you do this, this is called the main diagonal, coming from top left to bottom right. You write down that one and then you subtract the other one. So A2, B3, minus B2, A3, times I. Putting those in parentheses just to say this is one number that scaled to I. And then minus, and do the same thing. A1, B3, minus B1, A3. And then plus A1, B2, minus B1, A2. So if we want to represent it with the angle brackets, this would be in the first slot, this would be in the second, and that would be in the third. So I'm, I'm not going to write it all out again. I'm just going to say that would be there, that would be there, that would be there. Um, when you're working through this process, what do you think is the easiest part to forget about and mess up on? Um, negative on a J. Yeah, this is the, the most common mistake is is remembering this minus sign. So get some practice calculating that. You may come back to it next week and mess up. That's okay. Remind yourself. You may mess up again in three weeks, that's okay, you remind yourself and you'll be able to remember it longer the more practice you get. And then um, if you remember that, then the easiest place to actually make just a calculational mistake is just distributing this negative, trying to do it in your head and messing that up a little bit. That one's definitely more complicated than the dot product. But it has a significant, it has a significantly larger amount of information encoded into it. So that's to be expected, that it's more difficult. Do you guys want to ask any questions right now about dot products or cross products? So, so the dot product gives you a scalar number. Yes, the, the cross product gives you another vector. That's right. Okay. That's right. So sometimes uh, the dot product is called the scalar product, and the cross product is called the vector product. Okay. 
I think those are actually better names for it. Um, I think the dot product and the cross product are, are, you know, they're just based on the conventional symbols and it's not very descriptive. So a scalar product and vector product. Yes, sir. Can I take a picture? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. You want me to pose in front of me? <laughs>